Hello, 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 and welcome to It's All Good. I'm your host, Latavia, and this week we're back for another episode, and uh, I am joined by my lovely parents, Felix and Violet Alexander, and so, well, when you guys were last on, I hadn't started doing the gratitude moment, so I like to start each episode with sharing something or a few things that I'm grateful for that day or this day or the week. So, Mom, would you like to get us started? Just anything or a person that you're grateful for? Thank you, Latavia. I am grateful that you decided to come and spend some time with us while you are on your vacation, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm happy to be here. Uh, Dad, what about you? I'm grateful to be alive, but more importantly, I think I'm grateful my mother is celebrating her 91st birthday, and I'm excited that she's still alive and well. Yes. And if you guys ever get the uh, pleasure of meeting her, she is still, she's not just 91, but she's still like doing really well up, taking care of herself, taking care of other people, actually, <laughs> um, and still cooking and doing all the, the things she enjoys doing. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm grateful to be home, be here with you all, um, as well as celebrating grandma and being able to not just get away, but a chance to see you all and some other family that I don't get to see as often because I don't live as close. And with COVID, because it's still here mm -hmm. and we are still social distancing and wearing our masks. So for all of those out there who seem to think wearing a mask is a problem, please get over yourselves and start wearing the mask so you can help us reduce this and we can try to move forward a little quicker than we have been because it's about time for school to start back. And yeah, and I'll agree to that. Wear your mask. <laughs> yes. When you get in your car, you fasten your seatbelt, right? Wear your mask. Exactly. If you all listened last week, and if you haven't, I would encourage you to to do so. You don't necessarily have to stop and go back, but I would encourage you to do so. But uh, in last week's episode, I was talking about, you know, how I do not want to be involved in any entanglements, and I don't want to uh, continue going forward in terms of relying on other people or trying to put the responsibility of my happiness on other people because we are responsible for our own happiness. And of course, happiness is a feeling, it's fleeting, it doesn't always stay. It's not like joy that's constant. But what I was shared last week is that I know for myself for a long time, I was looking outside or outward for happiness in terms of well, how, what is going on, circumstances, things of that nature in terms of whether or not I was happy, but learning that, no, it's just, I get to choose, I choose that. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to have you all join is to, one, I, you know, I have great respect, love, and admiration for you all, but I know that as I have gotten older and, you know, been on my own, I would say my, I always view you all as my parents, not that I necessarily thought you were perfect, but I kind of did have this kind of tainted image, so to speak, of, oh, my parents, they're together. And even some other people will comment in terms of, oh, yeah, they're still together. Oh, y'all look so great. And sometimes people would jokingly call us the Cosbys or different things of that nature. And it's just like, well, no, nobody's perfect and everyone has their challenges. But I will say that as I have gotten older and started, you know, dating or being in relationships, getting a greater appreciation and understand for you all as humans first <laughs> as individuals and not just as my parents in terms of just watching you all grow individually as well as collectively in your relationship so wanted to know if you all could just share a little bit about how you all met and um how long you all have been married or together and or married and married wow let's see Hmm, I think I'll let you share that. <laughs> we met in 1982. Okay. 1982, I was in the Air Force and stationed at Shore Air Force Base. And my organization, my unit, did a joint exercise with the Army. 
and so we deployed to Fort Bragg, we set up there, and we were, the exercise probably lasted probably three or four weeks, and I think somewhere around the maybe second week, a friend of mine suggested we get away from the exercise, kind of have a downtime, and we went to the Willie's Club. The Officers Club, which was called Willie's. And uh, just an opportunity to, to get away. And it was during that time at the Officers Club that I, I met Violet. And uh, introduced myself, did I guess danced a couple times, exchanged phone numbers, and, and followed up from that point. Okay. Mom, what's your side? What's my version of yeah, it? Yeah, what's your version? Okay, let me give you the real version. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of buttered it up, you know, made it sound great, but it wasn't that easy. We met at the club, right? He was there, T.Y., and I loved to dance. He didn't really like dancing, so he danced. And the other thing was, he said we exchanged phone numbers, but there were some things before we exchanged phone numbers because I wanted to know, out of all these people in the club, why can't you go talk to somebody else? That was my response. And so I said, so, so he's the kind of person that likes a challenge. And so that kind of provoked him. And he was very persistent at night in terms of meeting me and exchanging phone numbers. And needless to say, I thought I was giving him the wrong phone number, but he was so wise and intelligent. I gave him two different numbers. The one that I normally answer, I didn't give him that one. I gave him the one that I didn't use the answer. So he heard me, I guess he heard, <laughs> or somewhere or another, he got both numbers and he called on the other number that I normally answer. And I answered it and then I was like, wow, he's persistent, he's for real. Okay, so a little bit of a challenge to, I guess, get past the first. <laughs> <laughs> you guys first initially met, so I guess you met in 82, but you guys also got married in 82, right? Yes. So how long did you all date? Well, or court or whatever you called it at that time. Technically, it wasn't much dating. Uh, we met in, I, I say January of 82, um, got married in September of 82. Okay, but so we weren't dating all that time. We weren't dating. Actually, um, after meeting her in January, we talked a little bit, and I think we may have came together again around March, I guess for her birthday. Um, and she, cause she was in school, she finished school in May. And then I think we may have got together once, once more before she, after she graduated. And then she went off to Connecticut. Connecticut. And so between that time, we communicated back and forth. And I think I asked her to marry me in May. And um, no, May, June, sometime in that time frame. And so um, I think it was, uh, like I said, it was a night we got married in September. So it wasn't a whole lot of dating in there. Okay, well, that's news to me. I knew it was short, but I didn't realize those were all the different details. So. I guess it sounds like you all were long distance because you said you were TDY um, and you were only in, so I don't know if you guys said you guys were in North Carolina when you met, but so you were only there briefly. Briefly. And then so it sounds like the majority of it was long distance and yes. then you guys got married in September, September of 82. So what was... Sorry, like I said, I'm processing <laughs> some of this. Um, but okay, so just kind of try to get to the, the topic of um, just... Okay, I'm sorry, I can't skip this. So you guys were long distance, mm -hmm. and then you were in Connecticut from May until when? Uh, end of August. So May to the end of August, you were in Connecticut, you were in South Carolina. Yes. And you all were, I guess, planning a wedding long distance because you got married in North Carolina. So right. How right. did? Well, I, I'm. <laughs> we weren't planning a wedding because my philosophy is why spend all that money on a wedding. So it was a lot of it was a lot of planning. Okay. But his family wanted to have a wedding, so we basically they planned it for us. Okay. While we while I was in Connecticut, and he was in at Shaw. Yeah. Okay. 
And if I remember correctly, the wedding itself or the ceremony was in North Carolina in Tarboro. And then you guys drove to Florida, the South, Florida, Florida. South Carolina for the reception. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who know me and say I'm always driving, you understand a little better <laughs> where I get it from because they started off distance and driving and they love driving to this day. Um, okay, so you guys got married like with, with what sounds like very little in-person interaction or time together a lot, I'm assuming over the phone or clearly there was no internet then <laughs> or text messages. So Absolutely. it was the phone and letters or just the phone? Primarily the phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what was that transition like then in terms of going from knowing very little, I'm assuming, about one another. Enough to know that you wanted to get married. <laughs> but um, I guess because one of the things that I was talking about before in terms of getting to know someone uh, or from a relationship standpoint of just red flags or green flags, like what are, so what were, I'll start with, what were some green flags and green flags in the sense of things that you saw or found out about the other that you liked and were like, hey, no, this is a reason for me to continue getting to know this person. Or I believe, yes, I can be married and I can build a life with this person. Wow. Wow, wow. Let's see. A green flag. One was uh, honesty. He is the most honest person you ever want to meet. <laughs> he is so honest. It, it just takes the H. I mean, it makes the H a big H in honest. <laughs> so I admired honesty. I admired integrity and persistency. And um, I'm going to add in a sidebar. I didn't know him that well, but my friends knew him. And what was some of the green flags? Oh, that's right. We're talking about the green flags. We're not gonna, okay, let's just focus on the green. All right, yeah, those some of the, those are those are some of the green flags. Yeah, those are the green flags. Okay, Dad, what about you? Uh, for me, it was more of a. There was a mixture of things. It was a sense of peace, um, being able to uh, communicate and and talk to her or have conversation with her. Despite the fact that she was a little bit challenging, uh, that was a bit intriguing. So just to find out, you know, what is it that's behind this facade or what is it that's going on? So I wanted to dig a little deeper. And there was a sense of peace. Um, to me, that's important that you have a sense of peace in terms of being able to communicate with uh, an individual. So, so those kinds of things, uh, I found her attractive as well. And so after leaving, she stayed on my mind. And so I wanted to know what was it about. So it was that intrigue that kind of kept me stayed interested, stayed focused, because again, you, you meet people and you, you say, you know, but, but for whatever reason, the interaction, the interchange with her, she stayed on my mind and kind of stayed. Matter of fact, to the point that I called up a, a family member an art that I, I admire and love dearly and, and talk with her about it in Canada. And I was at a point also in my life where I was, I wanted to settle down, I wanted to get situated. And um, she seemed to be the kind of person that I thought that we could, could connect with and, and kind of go from there. So more of an instinct, gut feeling type stuff. Okay. All right, so it sounds like you guys were both kind of operating off of instinct. And you said before, Mom, you said some some people that you knew or friends of yours knew him or knew of him. No, that goes with the red flags. Well, go, we, we're going to talk flags. about those too. Well. So, so what was, I guess, what was that in terms of maybe a hesitation? Oh, a hesitation? Um, okay, I'll start with when I was... Before I got to college, I had a relationship with God. I still had a relationship. But once I got to college, I kind of, uh, it was a uh, free flow. I still went to church, but not like I used to. So I had this friend who was, uh, I guess you could just say she was a little demon herself, but not really a demon. But she said, you don't want to marry him because Felix he stay in church all day, every day. <laughs> she said, he's going to have you wearing those little white things on your head, long dresses, and cotton stockings. 
<laughs> so that visual, it kind of stuck in my mind. I was like, little white things, those little white dollies you wear on your head when you see people in church, long dresses. And she said, you're not going to ever be able to do anything else. You're going to be in church all day and every day. He'll find a way to go to get you to church. And I was like, oh my God. So that kind of had me a little concerned. So you know me, I had the, I had the audacity to ask him. I said, once we get married, are you going to, no, do I have to change? He says, no, you don't have to change. So I was like, all right, then we can get married. Don't believe that. Don't believe what? We don't have the capability or the know-how to change a person. So I wasn't able, to, I had to make a change in order to make the relationship better or to prosper or to go forward in the marriage. So there is going to be some changes that has to be made. Okay. I didn't want to, but uh, it was like pulling a teeth, pulling a tooth. So are you, I just want to make sure I understand. So are you saying it wasn't necessary? I guess initially he said you didn't have to change. Right. But you realized once getting into the marriage that changes were necessary, but was it that he was, was he pushing the changes or was it just you realized that you there was some, I guess, how did that work? Both. Okay. <laughs> Both. Okay. Yes. So before we go further into that, I guess, Dad, what, if any, red flags or concerns <laughs> did you have going into it? Well, I wouldn't say there were concerns or red flags because, again, to be honest with you, um, the biggest one probably was I didn't know her. And I was willing to take a chance based on a feeling because I really didn't know her. Um, there was a time when she came to visit me in Sumter and we went shopping and I offered to purchase her something. And she said, oh, I don't want anything, I'm good. And so I thought, wow, it's an <laughs> opportunity to, uh, to do something nice, to, to get her something. And, and she says, no, I, I don't want anything. And I'm thinking, wow, if this is how it is, then that's all right. Because I'm not a materialistic kind of person, but I'm certainly a giver. And so I was willing to give that, but I thought it was, was kind of unusual. And so that, that, that wasn't a red flag, but it was like, a, it's like okay. Maybe she's not materialistic. And out of that behavior, um, I think it, it pulled me in because then I went out of my way to do things for her. And so even prior to marrying her, I bought her a car. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. You like giving cars. <laughs> there are a lot of people who have benefited from his his um, generosity. generosity and giving heart. I mean, I've certainly benefited from it, but I know of at least three cars that come to mind that he has given away, but continue. Okay. But, but yeah, there was no real set red flag prior to the marriage. Um, there were, there were indications in the conversations that we would have, but I just kind of dismissed it because I was so focused on, getting married again I was uh, I was alone I was I felt the need to 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 have companionship I was in a military organization where we traveled a lot and oftentimes when we returned from from our trips my friends would go home to their families and I would go home to a lonely apartment and so that feeling was not there very good and so that whole thought of Connecting and uniting and being with somebody, having somebody to, there to support and encourage. All right. So you all had enough of, uh, I guess, gut feelings or instincts about the other in terms of, okay, I don't really know this person, but I know enough to know that I'm willing to essentially take a chance yes. on, on them. Mm -hmm. And you get married and... How long, so I know that I was born in Wyoming in 87, so, but before then you all were in California? We had a, we, we, we went to, yeah, when we first got married, we stayed in Sumter, South Carolina at Shore Force Base for about a year. And from there I got an assignment and I went to training in California, Lompoc, California for missile, as a missile officer. 
I was in training in, in, in um, California for approximately six months. And then from there, we went to Cheyenne, Wyoming. Okay. So I guess the question I'm trying to get to with that is, so you, with it being, I don't know, rushed is the right word for your dating to getting to marry, but what was that transition like in terms of like, oh, we're married and I knew a little bit about this person, mm -hmm. but most of our interactions were over the phone or from a distance. Right. So now mm -hmm. I live with this person and not only living with this person, I'm now moving all over, I'm moving multiple mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, California was completely across the country from, mm -hmm. for both of you all because mm -hmm. you're both from the East Coast. So just mm -hmm. what were, I guess, some of the things going through your minds in terms of, okay, I took this chance. How do I stay? Like, what kept you there um, initially? From my, well, my opinion or my perspective was, because I was still young and dumb. So I said, well, if it doesn't work, okay, we're leaving from the East Coast going West. So I looked at marriage then as an insurance policy. I said, okay, if it don't work, we can just go our separate ways. And so that being in my mind made the transition somewhat, not as challenging, but it wasn't that challenging. And then on the other hand, if we had not gone West, I don't believe we'd be together today. Absolutely. Because a lot of times relationships don't work that well mm -hmm. when you're near family or you're in that environment where you're comfortable and if something goes wrong, you know you don't have far to go. You can leave, go back to your parents, or maybe you have that other support system that you can lean on, mm -hmm. and uh, you just don't have to stay there and deal with it. So in our relationship for us, moving cross country was beneficial. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So now part of the, 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 I think when we first got married, and like she said, the part of, not wanting to or didn't have to change. And so one of the, 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 the challenges early on, uh, as she pointed out, she was still into the uh, party atmosphere mindset, if you would. And uh, I was never much of one to party. I, I, I did occasionally go out, um, but her philosophy was she wanted to get out, she wanted to have a good time. And so, on most military installations during that particular time, a lot of people, when they went to uh, to party, they would go to the non-commissioned officer or the NCO club. And so that was something that, that she did, um, you know, when she was in college. And so as after she got married, she met a few people and that's what they were doing. They were going to the NCO club to party. And on several occasions, she would go um, without me. <laughs> and uh, there was a couple of times she would make the, you know, say, well, when will you be back when I get back? And so she had that kind of mindset, that kind of attitude. And so that's what she did um, on several occasions. And even on, on a couple of, on one occasion, I could think in particular, she had gone out and, and made acquaintance with uh, a guy and he happened to be an enlisted guy. And... Uh, I don't know if she gave him her phone number or gave him her address, <laughs> but this guy shows up to our house oh. to come see her. <laughs> and uh, an enlisted guy coming to an officer's house to see his wife. Mm. Um, pretty bold guy. And so that was kind of like, what's this all about? And, and there were conversations she and I would have occasionally about that. It even got to the point where you know, I went home and <laughs> consulted with my mom, like, okay, how do I handle this situation? And she reminded me that you weren't always on point and you had to learn. So why not go to the club with her occasionally, meet her where she is type thing. And so I tried that and um, unfortunately it probably was more miserable for her than it was for me. <laughs> because uh, again, I did not, I was not actively engaged or, or participate in that, in that type of activity. So, uh, so like she said, had we remained in the South Carolina area uh, because of those type of early frictions, uh, 
it wasn't going to last. And the fact that we were, you know, we were blessed to, 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 to be relocated elsewhere. And when we got to Wyoming, we didn't know anybody. So we learned to depend and rely on each other. And I think that began to open up our lines of communications even more. Okay, hold up, hold up. Rewind. Let's go back <laughs> a little bit. Let's go back. I didn't give the young man my, uh, if uh, Air Force Base, everybody is right there close together. We were out in the yard working that day. The afternoon we were out there working and he saw me. That's how he knew where I lived. Okay. But he still walked up. To the house? No. <laughs> he stopped. He stopped. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, okay. I mean, for those who are not in the military <laughs> and say they get married, whether it's quick or whatever, but they're still living close, mm -hmm. <laughs> that they don't have the, I guess, the benefit of the military dictating where you live. Mm -hmm. How would you, I guess, so... If for those who are not in the military or say they don't move away and they are living close, I guess what is something you would suggest to people that when they do know that they have that quote unquote safety net of family or friends around them, like what are some things that you would encourage them to do to kind of to strengthen their relationship and reliance on one another? For me, I think it's important to establish boundaries and Early on, I don't think that's something she and I talked about or even did. We just assume certain things about the other. And so in terms of um, interacting with family or friends, establish boundaries early on. Talk about it. Uh, matter of fact, for me, I think the key to any successful relationship is communicating. Communicating early on and and, and honest about what's going on, put it out, lay it out on the table and be able to have those hard discussions because I think that's where people get in trouble is they don't communicate, they don't share what they're really feeling and then the other piece is learning to listen to what is being said, not what you think is being said, listen to what is being said and then again to reflect, rephrase, to make sure you have an understanding with each other. Okay. Mom, you have anything to add to that? Well, I would add uh, find a support group, making that transition, getting out of uh, you coming, going into an unfamiliar territory. Your surroundings are different. People, cultures are different. You just, I mean, life happens real quickly. So find someone that you can trust, another couple mm -hmm. that you can have that support system in place and talk, communicate, know your surroundings meet people, don't live in a bubble. Make sure you get out there and make the best of wherever you are. Even though you are a long distance from where you live, there are other people that are there are in the same situation you're in. Right. So and it's like being in the military, that family, the military family, sometimes become closer to you than your biological family. Right. So being in that situation in the military, find someone that you can connect with, get involved with the support group and stick it out. Yeah. And it's also true, not just in terms of a military family, any family or any mm -hmm. couple, mm -hmm. wherever you are, try to find somebody, whether it's in, in, in a church environment mm -hmm. or somebody that you work with, or, or again, some type of social club or this fraternity sorority, but find another couple that you can connect with and talk to and kind of share. And, and ideally, if you can find an older couple as well, somebody that can speak into your into your lives that you can go to and kind of get wise counsel from, as well as having that couple that you can do things with, that, that's important. Okay, you both mentioned boundaries in terms of uh, initially starting, that you said you didn't necessarily have specific conversations about boundaries. Okay. Um, so when, I guess, at what point did you all start having those conversations and in you know hindsight being 2020 <laughs> when would you have if you would you know if you could do it again when would you do the when would you start having that conversation versus when you did in real life for me i would start having them immediately after we have our premarital counseling before we say for me for my for my for me we would have those conversations before I do. Before we say I do, we would, uh, before we say I do is so very significant. I mean, it's important 
to put those boundary, boundaries in place and the couple come up with an agreement on those boundaries. Make sure you understand each other. Because if you don't put those boundaries in place before you get married and continue to talk about and to practice those boundaries, it makes more for a successful relationship. And when you say boundaries, you mean specific boundaries or just overall boundaries? Boundaries, specific mm -hmm. boundaries. And, and in terms of, I guess, specific boundaries, I know, I think before you all were talking about it in the context of family or friends, like outsiders mm -hmm. in terms of how much are we going to rely or let them into our relationship, which I think mm -hmm. is important. Um, but I guess going into specifics, just your personal boundaries mm -hmm. in terms of, because I know one thing that in some of my relationships, whether it be with friends or romantic, it's mm -hmm. one thing I, that sticks out. And one of them was just, okay, I know that we're going to get into disagreements or we're going to argue, but I need us to have some some boundaries or some, I need to know there's certain lines you're not going to cross exactly. even when you're upset. Um, Cause I remember telling somebody, look, I know at this point I'm going to say something that's going to piss you off at some point and you're mm -hmm. going to get upset just because I know me, but I need to know that when we get into this disagreement and we're going back and forth, you're not going to hit below the belt. Mm -hmm. So when did you all get to the point of having those conversations of, Hey, hold up. Uh, I see what you're trying to do, but what you're not going to do is talk to me this way. Or <laughs> it's, and, and I'm, I'm saying this, I have the benefit of knowing them and their personalities. But <laughs> so how, I guess, yes, with you all being so opposite <laughs> personality wise. Yes. Yeah. Excuse me a minute. Let me add that. You hear the statement opposites attract. Uh uh. Opposites attack. Well, in, in, in dating, opposites attract. But in marriage, opposites attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <laughs> so how to break that down? <laughs> no, or because, expand? Because I think what happens is the things that you find appealing when you're dating, uh, say, oh, that's cute. I can deal with that. And because, again, you're just dating. If I don't like it, I can just walk away. But once you're married to an individual and there are opposites there, uh, now you got to face it head on and I may not like it. She may not like it. And so now we have to find a way to address it without creating a major disagreement. And so that's the challenge because if, 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 if she does something that I'm not overly fond of or vice versa, now I got to either bite my tongue per se and walk on eggshells or I need to confront it head on and deal with the repercussion. Because again, if there's something that you're totally in disagreement with, mm -hmm. you can only tolerate it for a season. And after a while it's like, okay, let's, let's deal with this. And so it's when you deal with it and how you deal with it makes a difference, especially if you communicate totally different from each other. Mm -hmm. And Which we do. do. <laughs> and so we had to learn how to fight fair. Um, I needed to recognize that I need to address the issue and not her and vice versa. Because too many times when things got heated, instead of going after the issue, now it becomes personal. And so you're going to attack me and say something about me or vice versa. And so the fight is not fair. And so the issue becomes cloudy because now we're going after each other and, and, and probably expressing things that you've been suppressing for some time. Mm -hmm. you've been holding back and now all of a sudden I get to get out what's on my mind <laughs> which is unfair so you said <laughs> expressing yourself or addressing it and that's something that I know I've told you all both over the last several years that I feel like I've got kind of equal parts of both of your personality mm -hmm. um, which makes for a very interesting <laughs> interesting life also why I get such random thoughts mm -hmm. but Kind of to that point of learning how to communicate, was there a a kind of a breaking point? Was there something that if you think back over the last, oh yeah, because you guys didn't answer that question earlier of how long you've been married, um, the last almost 38 years, I think mm -hmm. now, September. Mm -hmm. So was there a specific kind of like moment where you remember like, okay, this is when it shifted or you realized you had to shift in terms of 
learning how to communicate? Was it like one specific time? Have there been <laughs> multiple times? <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, it's wow. Wow. Mm. I'll let you answer that. I think there's been multiple, multiple. times. Multiple. Okay. Multiple times. I mean, there have been, there have been issues throughout. And um, I've been the type that I suffered in silence, per se. Things would happen, and in order to keep the peace, I wouldn't say anything. I'd just kind of let it ride. And that's not a good thing either, because what happens is things build up. And they keep building up and building up. And until a point where, okay, I can't t t take it anymore. And when it when it's addressed, it's not addressed appropriately. It, it, it comes out in a, in a way that is condescending in some respect. And so that's not a good thing. And I wouldn't encourage anybody to do that. It's wiser to address and deal with things head on when they happen. Unfortunately, I didn't do that. And so for me, it was years of sucking it up and, and trying to be that good husband, trying to be that supporter, that provider in all the times. And, and at the same time, it's, it's, it's building. And then the other mistake I made, instead of going to her and talking to her, I would find outside sources to kind of vent to, which is a not a good thing either. It's because you want to keep everything internally and address it between the two of you. Anything to add? Uh, I think uh, your question was what point, what happened? Yeah, was there, like, if there, is there something that sticks out in your mind in terms of you remember, like, it was like, okay, today is the day, enough is enough, or something's got to give? I think the, the, it's not that major, but I think it was early on in our marriage because I'm the kind of person, uh, I guess it was a habit that I had formed in college that I would like to drink just one Coke, one rum and Coke, just one, <laughs> that's all, just one. I just get one and I'm happy. And then um, it led to, uh, yeah, no, it was, we were in Germany, Linda liked wine coolers. And the breaking point was I bought some wine coolers home in the refrigerator and I put them in the refrigerator and I knew how he felt about alcohol. That was the point where we knew we had to put some boundaries in place. Was that the question, boundaries or? Well, yeah, that's a part of it in terms of boundaries or, or what, just what made, made you realize that, that you had to, essentially those changes that you oh, thought you weren't oh. going to have to make. Oh, yes, yes. I guess yes. kind of, so you're saying you put them in the refrigerator knowing he didn't like them being there. So you were saying, I'm putting them in there because it's my refrigerator too. <laughs> or it was just his reaction to it. No, I, it. I put them there because I felt like, okay, this is our refrigerator. I live here. I am an adult. I can and, do what I want. To do. I mean, it's just a wine cooler. It's just in the refrigerator. But knowing, I knew how he felt about alcohol. But I didn't think wine cooler was such an issue. It was just a wine cooler. And so I felt like it was okay to put them in the refrigerator. But then I didn't think about the whole scenario behind that wine cooler in the refrigerator. Okay, what was the whole scenario? <laughs> <laughs> you can't just, that, that you I can't would, just dangle it. That if I had it in the refrigerator, I would continue drinking them. Okay, so it was... It, it, and it would become... Okay, okay, I start here with the little wine coolers, I put them in there, and then I would probably every weekend have them bring them putting in the refrigerator. So it would would not be a good thing for the relationship. Because sometimes alcohol gives you that courage to say things that you don't normally say. And so it <laughs> that probably... liquid courage. Yeah, that liquid courage. Because uh, there were times I was like, okay, we're married, so I don't really know how to communicate what I want to say. So I get the wine cooler, then it just come out free, free flow. <laughs> She's like, hey, it's been something I've been thinking about, right. I've been I've wanting been to say for a, a while. long time, and here it is. And now all my inhibitions are gone, I'm going to just say it. <laughs> so I guess, so Dad, for you, how was, I guess, what was the reaction or conversations following that? Actually, I'll be honest with you, I, I really don't recall the specific. I, um, I probably reacted, and this is one of those childhood traumas. And so to, to understand my reaction, you'd have to understand my, my growing up and what I experienced as a kid as it relates to alcohol and being around that environment. And there was nothing positive about that. It's all negative, um, either from 
just the way I was raised in terms of it being in the household and the, the people and the criticisms and the put downs associated with that. And so that was a constant reminder. I saw all the negativities associated with alcohol and I didn't want that to be a part of my life and certainly not in my household. And so it wasn't just her having a wine cooler. It was one of those being re-traumatized, if you would, mm -hmm. because of the experiences. And so that's what it represents. Okay, so it was almost like that was a trigger of, yes. of memories. And mm -hmm. so, but for you, from your standpoint is, look, I just want my wine cooler. I want to be able to have it in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at that point in our marriage, that we was like, that's your problem. That was your <laughs> trauma, not mine. So, I mean, you know, this is just how early. And, and that, you know, and she brings that up and see, that's another part of really getting to know each other. And we really didn't is her upbringing versus my upbringing uh, was totally different. Mm -hmm. And the way she handled situations versus the way I handle it based on what was in my household or my family coming up was different. And so that's the other thing we've noticed too, mm -hmm. is her approach to issues is one way and my approach is, is different. And again, we bump heads about it. Mm -hmm. um, her focus on having certain things, she had a greater emphasis on that versus me I can have it or not have it, it's, it's irrelevant. And so, so it's, it's a lot of those things. And so a part of the challenge, and I strongly encourage uh, young couples not to do, my attempt was to appease her. And so I would go out of my way to appease her. And, and, and for us, the appeasement was materialistic, getting her things, buying her things, allowing her to have her way materialistically. Um, and that wasn't a good thing, but it was, a way I thought that I could, one, keep the peace, but also continue to win her affection. So, so it sounds like he was trying to buy me, huh? Exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. Because of an insecurity <laughs> that I had. Not being right. against her, it was my insecurities. Well, you know, I guess I hear that. And so I'm based on what, how you all both said it, obviously it didn't work. I guess it worked for a while. It worked for a while. But it, at some point, it sounds like, well, I know that at some point it, it stopped working. But so that was where you were coming from in the standpoint of I'm trying to keep the peace. I don't want to ruffle feathers. She likes these things. And so when she has them, she's happy and things are good. There's mm -hmm. no issues. So for you receiving them, I guess, what was your mindset or your perspective of that in terms of that was a... I guess it became the norm or was it something that you grew to expect or you just appreciated what the, the what? him buying things well, or doing see, things the thing or giving is, things? Oh, the thing is, I never said I wanted those things. Well, no, I, I get that. But I'm saying in the sense of <laughs> when you're receiving them. <laughs> I mean, when I received them, I was grateful. I was thankful. But I did not know then that he felt like he had to continue doing those things. So I'm not going to say don't do it. <laughs> Okay, but don't do it, but um, I guess if you can recall, though, I guess in getting them, so of course you're saying, hey, I never asked for this. Mm -hmm. Well, And I, I guess I asked this because I know for me in the sense of I don't there's something that I didn't ask for. But when someone starts doing it and mm -hmm. then you do it for a little while, mm -hmm. subconsciously or consciously, I create there's some a certain level of expectation gets created. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. And so then if it stops or there's a, not even necessarily stops, but if there's a change, then I notice it mm -hmm. and it's concerning of like, well, Hey, well, what changed? Mm -hmm. Um, so I like without getting into, you know, all of the details, I know that at some point there was a shift in terms of the amount of gifts or things that were purchased or giving. So, yeah, the change came when he got out of the military. That's what... <laughs> when the when the money the wasn't money, as, wasn't, wasn't the as strong money. as it was was yeah. Okay, <laughs> money wasn't flowing so green. So that's when the change came about. Okay, and so for you, what was the what was that like for you, or what did how did you feel? It was a little shock. I mean, it was a little shocking. It took me a while to grasp it. So how to make it up? I got a part time job. And then I charged a lot. 
Okay. So I created. <laughs> so you had. So you had become. You had grown accustomed. As I tell people, you know, I've grown accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Yeah. And I want to maintain that. Mm -hmm. And so, in your, I guess the approach was, well, hey, we want to keep doing or living a certain mm -hmm. way, or I want to keep getting a certain thing. So, mm -hmm. in doing that, it sounds like some additional challenges or things mm -hmm. were created Developed because of the challenge. Trying to solve, yeah. trying to address one issue, created. creating another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that actually, okay. So knowing that you all have personalities that are so different, um, you have been together for a long time and we, um, I've heard the same, you know, I think that earlier you were saying, Someone said in their marriage, you know, oh, their their spouse told them, oh, you've changed. And mm -hmm. he's like, I would hope so. Yes. Um, and obviously over the last almost 38 years, you all have changed and evolved. Mm -hmm. But in that, in terms of kind of going back to the beginning, talking about what do you do to maintain or secure your own happiness, your mm -hmm. own joy? What are some of the things that you all have done over the years to do that? For me, again, it's, it's recognizing my shortfalls, recognizing my weaknesses, my insecurities, and finding ways to, uh, to address it. For example, um, most people wouldn't believe it, but I used to have very low self-esteem. I questioned myself, questioned my abilities. And so I found my solace in the Word of God. I found my strength in the Word of God. And so that's where I hit in the Bible, in scripture, studying that so that I could be more proficient in that area. And as I grew and got stronger in my faith, then I was able to get stronger in other aspects of my life. The other thing I learned early on that I was holding on to a lot of frustrations, not all because of her, but some other things that I probably didn't deal with in, in childhood. Mm -hmm. And so I had to find a way to, 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 to re be able to, to address those. And so I know that if I held things in for, because for a season, when she would get me upset, I was one of those guys who would pout per se, and I would get silent and I wouldn't say anything. And we'd be in the house together, but we wouldn't be talking. So I realized that I needed to find a way to deal with that inner frustration. So I started doing things. And, and one of the things I used to do with, was, was sports. And, and, and most recently, or probably over the last 15, 20 years, is was learning to play racquetball. And so what I did was all the anger and the frustration that I had internally, I would put it on the face of the ball and I would go into a court and, and play. And when I came out of the court, all that anger and that frustration that I had, I vented on with, with, with that. And so I was better able to do it versus attacking her. Because a lot of times, unbeknownst to me, my anger was indirectly targeted towards her. So for me, it was learning and recognizing my shortcomings and then putting things in place to help me better deal with that. Okay. Mom, what about you? What was the question? What are some <laughs> things that you've done? <laughs> How do you maintain your happy or your joy oh, okay, in the okay. midst <laughs> of the marriage? How do I maintain my joy in my happiness yes like what do you do okay you know it took me a while like some years because that for a point i was depending on him for my happiness so what i had to realize is and i guess it has to do because of my upbringing the things that i saw in marriages the different things that i was taught or told i was uh, uh depending on him for my happiness but the thing that i want to point out is we can't expect a man to bring us what we need in terms of emotionally, physically, spiritually. And that's what I was looking towards him for my happiness and not to God. But after I realized that he couldn't fulfill, he couldn't keep me happy. So what I started doing, I became, a, I love uh, fitness anyway. So I became a, an aerobics instructor and I did that for, I mean, I just found myself in the gym. I, he hid behind the word, I hid in the gym. So that's how I was an overcomer. 
Oh, if only I knew these things growing up, because when I tell you, they love the gym and they love working out. And little did I know, or my sister and I, we didn't know these were y'all stress relievers. And this was, these were, so what they're, what, uh, as they were figuring out how to maintain their happy and their joy and these, all these stress relievers. They included my sister and I in on this. We didn't want to leave you out. Oh, so, so, thanks. You know? you, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, so, to the tune of getting up at whatever time in the morning it was. Oh, dark to, 30. Oh, dark 30 to go running before school yes. um, and going to her spin classes or aerobics, step aerobics and whatever else. I have not mastered racquetball, but I have learned the basics. When it was basketball, I was cool. But it's interesting to know that 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 is a part of as much as I just saw it as oh, they just love working out, and she wants to be healthy. And mm. you know, we stopped eating red meat, and it was we learned about turkey bacon and ground <laughs> turkey and all these other things um, in the mid '90s. But uh, it's interesting to hear that and now know the context that you all were personally trying to figure things out like you were trying to figure things out for yourselves mm -hmm. because i guess like i said hindsight being 2020 but even just thinking about it now you all were you all got married when you were 25 yes yeah uh me at 25 and being in marriage crap mm, yeah i don't know how great that would have worked for me at 25 but me either. well no i'm just thinking thinking about where i was i thought that i wanted mm -hmm. i would say at 25 i did want to and i thought that i would be because mm -hmm. For me, a lot of it, I was basing it off of what I saw with you all's relationship. And it's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, they were both done with college. They were around 25. They got married at 25. I was like, well, I'll be done with school at 25. And, mm. But yeah, that didn't happen. So, but yes, um, you all figured that out. When, and I know to a certain extent, you're, I imagine you're still figuring some things out. A lot of things. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's a lifelong learning process. It's not. It's not marriage is not something that you master at. It's, there isn't a certain time where you can say, okay, after you've been married 20 years, I got this. Mm -hmm. We know each other. We can figure each other out. We know what's going to come first, second, third. No, because life yeah. happens. We're mm -hmm. always developing, always growing, and we have to maintain an open mind. Uh, you can never assume I know him, I know her. Uh, and, and that's where you make a mistake. You got to always be open, always receptive and be extremely flexible. But in the midst of all that, I can't stress it enough. We have to communicate. We have to talk to each other. And too many times in relationships, we're, we're talking, but we're not communicating. Mm -hmm. We're not on the same level. Uh, we don't understand. And so again, in, in conversation, especially with that significant other, if he or she says something and you're not quite sure, did I understand you to say? Make sure you get clarification. Because I think a lot of the times with, with, with Rollin and I, she was talking one thing and I was thinking something totally different. And, and, and it's later than you bump heads and say, well, I thought you said, no, I said. And so that creates conflict, that creates friction. And so it's a lot of the things that you know, a romantic interchange is not enough to sustain a marriage. <laughs> so really, love is not enough? Love is enough if it's agape love. But just this romantic love, this, this eros, is not enough. It, it, it has to be built on a, on a solid foundation. And, 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 and you do it by communicating. You do it by expressing what's really going on on the inside. Putting the cards on the table. Laying it out. Coming clean. Uh, and, and, and too many times we don't want to do that, especially men. Men don't tell you what they think all day long, mm -hmm. but they don't ever tell you how they really feel. And so when you can get a man to open up and start talking about how he feels, then you're making some, some headway. And I'd like to mm -hmm. add in terms of communication. Communication is the key. But the other thing that you want to add is becoming friends. Yes. When all else fails in the marriage mm -hmm. or in the relationship, mm -hmm. if you have built that friend relationship, getting to know each, each other, bonding, and you his friend, he your friend, y'all have that to hold on to. Because mm -hmm. if it's just, as he said, romantic, romanticism, sex, whatever, if you're not friends, you don't have anything. 
so you can build upon that friendship. And see, too many times in relationships, people are trying to spend too much trying to impress, trying to get to know, trying to, oh, will he like me? Will she like me? I can do this. I can do that. And you're so build so quickly on building a relationship that you forget about the importance of building a friendship. And most couples aren't friends. <laughs> Well, I'm certain that this uh, quarantine this year has certainly exposed that and tested some relationships. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, because yes. because when you think about a friend, most couples today, and, and, and I, I could be wrong, but I'd say over 50% of couples today, when you think about, I need to go talk to a friend, it is not their spouse. It's not their significant other. Most couples. There are some couples who do. Mm -hmm. I can talk to my husband. I can talk to my wife. But a lot of times, most couples have someone outside the relationship that they call, talk to and consult with. So to, to that point, in terms of thinking about boundaries and you want to develop a friendship. And for those of you listening, I hope you're taking notes because I am taking some mental notes in terms of just some of the things that you all have been talking about um, in terms of just things to think about prior to. But in terms of boundaries and having that outside person, is it is it still something somewhat beneficial to have someone outside of the marriage to to vent to? Like, you know, you still have your friends and you have your relationships, but I guess what is what is too much or what is enough in terms of what is safe to talk about in terms of venting to someone else? Anything that is personal <laughs> between she and I. A third party doesn't need to be involved unless we're seeking counseling. Excuse me. And that's just not in marital relationships. That's right. That's if you're in your dating. Mm -hmm. Your friends, it's none of their business what you and your significant other do or say. It's none of their business. Absolutely. So if you start from there before you get married, you won't run to outside people to share your concerns or thoughts. And again, it, when you connect and say, this is going to be my husband, my wife. It should be somebody that you feel that you can kind of be naked with, put it all on the table. Because in reality, when you think about a relationship, she's not my enemy and I'm not her enemy. That's my support. That's my, my, my strength, my, my pillar. And that's the way it should be. And so if I'm going to pour out everything, then I should be able to pour it out to her and she in turn to me. But in most cases, that doesn't happen that way. And that's why infidelity and affairs occur is because I can't go to her. I don't feel I can go to her and pour out my heart and say, this is where I am. So now I'm looking to somebody else, not with the intent of being in an outside relationship, but unfortunately, because one thing leads to another, that's where it occurs. Nobody, well, I can't show no, nobody, but most people don't intentionally go looking for another relationship. I'm just going to vent. Mm -hmm. And in the process of venting, something occurs, there's infidelity, there's, there's that affair, but that's not the plan or the purpose. And that's why it's so important that you keep it internally between you and your, your husband, your wife, and talk about those things, put it on the table. And if there's a third party, let it be a, a professional, a licensed professional, counselor, pastor, whatever, but don't just bring somebody in from the outside. That reminds me of, I think you all have said it and I've heard it said other times in that when you do go, you vent to family and you tell them when you're upset and then you and your significant other, you make up, but they're still upset <laughs> about <laughs> what happened yeah. a year ago or months ago and they don't let it go. Um, so that just kind of creates an additional problem exactly. for you. Mm -hmm. um, so in thinking of that, of lost my train of thought but so knowing what you know now mm -hmm. looking back so that's what I was going to say sorry before I do that in terms of measuring success I've heard before a lot of times people say oh so and so they've been married 44 years or they were married 50 something years and they've been married this so I think oftentimes it's easy to hear the number of years that mm -hmm. someone that a couple have been together <laughs> and think oh it was so wonderful they there's like kind of the model marriage and mm -hmm. then now learning that a lot of those relationships they've been together that long but they were unhappy or there was 
domestic violence. There was just a lot of different things going on. Mm -hmm. So I asked that to, I guess, say that to say, how do you all gauge or measure the success of your relationship? For me, it's it's flexibility. It's it's being open. It's being receptive. For me, it's about doing a self assessment. Where am I? When she makes a statement that I don't agree with, how do I respond to it? How do I approach it? Where before I would shut down and kind of go off to myself. Now I take a moment to process it and ask myself, what is the best way to approach this? How should I? address this, what do I need to do? So I think it's it's being honest with myself first and then being able to present it in such a way because I realize that not addressing it, holding it back creates more problems. So now it's meeting it head on. And so for me, success is to be able to go to her and openly share my thoughts and my feelings and she not necessarily agree with it, but she receives it and responds in a in a, in a positive manner. That's success for me. All right, because that's 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 growth, or that's a mm -hmm. shift in terms of how you used to do things versus now. Right. Is there anything that you can think of in terms of how you? Well, um, I would say for me, how I measure success is when the little things that used to happen and they would get on my reserve nerve. <laughs> And I've come to a point where I know I'm growing or I can see successes when those little things don't bother me anymore. So it's the little baby steps. The little thing, the little things make a world of a difference. Yes, they, yes do. they do. And you all haven't said it today, but I know that I've heard from both of you, more so you mom, uh, <coughs> in the sense of those things that you see when you're dating someone, mm -hmm. like in terms of how they are while you're dating, that's how they will be when you get married and it's not going to change. Um, and so how have you all, I know you said that you both had to make some changes mm -hmm. to make the, for the sake of the, the success of the relationship or the healthy or progression of the relationship. Mm -hmm. What are some of those things that you can think of about one another that you thought maybe it might change, but it hasn't. <laughs> that you've learned to... It's like, you know, yes, we've made changes. We've adapted. We've grown. But there's just that one thing that just <laughs> is not changing. And nothing has changed it over all of this time. But you've just learned to accept or live with. Well, I can't say that I've learned to accept <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> learn to tolerate I wouldn't even say tolerate okay <laughs> but you, it's, it hasn't been it has not become a deal breaker no 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 okay. no care to share or um, you know you have to really think about it so I'll let you share and it'll be provoke some of my thoughts okay because uh <laughs> Deal breaker. Um, I guess there's a phrase that I use, I use sometime and I ask myself the question, when is enough enough? And I've come to realize that there is not a place of enough because there's a perception that the more I get, the more I want. And so to me, that is something I've come to recognize that there's a, a desire or passion that she has for things that um, it, will, it will not go away. It will always be there. And I have to learn how to deal with that without allowing it to overwhelm me. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the one thing. Is, is learning to recognize that's who she is. Love it or not, that's who she is. And as long as we're together, that is a, is a concern that, that will always be there. And so learning to, <laughs> so I have to sat, settle within myself that that's, that's, that's real, it's not going anywhere. And the challenge becomes 
even though we come to an agreement and say we're not going to accept the fact that <laughs> chances are that's not going to be held true. I'm laughing because <laughs> you are so diplomatic. <laughs> and I know exactly what you're saying. Um, well, I'm being respectful. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, you see, I didn't answer because I didn't know how to be respectful. Oh. <laughs> like I said, personalities are very different. But I've got a little bit of both. And it's a struggle of balancing the, the you know, being diplomatic and saying it with grace or seasoning it with with, with grace. grace. Yeah, just trying to practice and the word. Just saying what I feel like. Yeah, this, saying. this area, I'm still growing. Season it with grace. Well, yes. Yeah, so, what I, I think what I have realized in thinking of like the mixture of you all's personality is I might, my words will be, my, may say, I may say it with grace, but my face is telling you how I really feel. Mm -hmm. And that's the part, you know, that I would say is still working out. But in. Looking back or thinking about everything that you all have we've talked about today, and I don't necessarily, I would say, like I said, for those listening, I would strongly encourage you to take notes in terms of the things that, that they've shared that they've learned, mm -hmm. um, in terms of just having certain conversations, addressing things early on. And there's a lot that we didn't yes. touch <laughs> on, mm -hmm. um, but looking back, would you do it again? In the sense of, would you get married as quickly as you did, or would you wait? I would wait. I would seriously wait. And I'm saying, for me, I would wait because of maturity, the matu having that level of maturity, mm -hmm. and getting to know him. Mm -hmm. I mean, really getting to know him. Yeah, yeah those things that I would, uh, I would do differently. Be mature, getting to know him. Find out, find out um, where to draw the line. When, 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 what, what things are you going to uh, really fall on your sword for? Yeah. Uh, am I going to really focus on this one thing, or am I just going to nail it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Learning when to choose your battles. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Those are, yeah, those things I would do differently. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dad? I, I agree. I, I think based on where I was when we got married, I, I definitely was not ready. Um, I, I say now that I married for the wrong reason. Uh, when I got married, again, I was in the military. I was alone. I think a lot of the reasons I got married because I was lonely and I was not mature nor ready for it. And I found that out early in the relationship. I found out that I was very, um, maybe possessive in some respects, very stern in others, very regimental in some respects. Um, and so maybe not as flexible. I was not the best communicator um, early on. And again, I didn't know, um, I was assuming based on what I observed in, in my mother, I was assuming that that was the kind of person she was. Um, and so again, there are a lot of assumptions that I made along the way. So I agree with her that getting to know, we didn't really go through marriage counseling. Um, there's a lot of things we didn't do. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we really didn't get to know each other because we were in separate states. So there's a lot of things you look back on and, and I firmly believe that our marriage has worked and has sustained itself because of the grace of God, uh, because of our walk with the Lord, uh, because otherwise I think she would have been out the door and certainly I would have been out the door had it not been a strong relationship with the Lord. So I think that has been the saving grace for both of us, that when we wanted to do certain things, we would turn to and look to God for guidance, and that's what sustained it. Grace. Mm, yes, grace. So, in I've had this conversation with you all and a lots of my friends of just obviously, well, maybe not obviously for you all because you're not having to deal with it because you're married. But dating is very, is I would say it's 
I'm sure someone say it's very different, but very it's still the same. Mm -hmm. But it's just different these days in terms of how dating is. I know neither of you all are the biggest fans of online dating, but it's just become a part of reality. But just if you could give a, some advice or suggestions outside of some of the things that you shared for those who are dating and things of, I would say, obviously getting, it sounds to me, one of the biggest things is getting to know yourself mm -hmm. and doing the work on yourself, spending the time getting to know yourself, um, really not necessarily before getting into a relationship, but even as that process is going, but what are, what it would be some additional advice or wisdom that you would share for those of us who are still single and dating and then also for a younger married couple. Hmm. I'll let you bring out some of your expertise wisdom on that <laughs> since you are a marriage counselor, <laughs> relationship counselor, <laughs> dating counselor. I think the, the, the key again is, is, is to do that self-assessment. Be honest with yourself. I can deceive others, but I can't deceive myself. Take a close look at me or at yourself to say, am I really ready for this? Or here's a better question. If I was going to date, would I date me? Would I date me? And so be honest with that because you know you better than anybody else. Uh, in terms of a relationship, you gotta, I can't overemphasize, you gotta communicate. You gotta be able to talk to one another openly and honestly. And, and both of you need to listen. And when you listen, listen for understanding. Don't wait to talk. Don't wait to get your point across. Listen to talk. Listen for understanding. And if you're not certain as to what's being said, ask for clarification. That is so, so important. Because as you establish that baseline and you establish those, those understandings, and then here's the key. If he or she shows themselves to you, <laughs> <laughs> believe it. Don't say, well, he or change or she or change or it's not that bad. No. Embrace the reality. If he's given you a clue, if she's given you a clue, recognize it. And if you can't tolerate it then, it only gets worse later. So again, it's being honest. And it's okay. It's okay to, to, to meet someone and see something that's not, that's not right. It's okay to cut those losses early on. Because the longer you are in the relationship, the more you got invested. And it's a little bit more difficult to do. And so now the challenge becomes, do I stay in a relationship because I made a commitment to it, although it's not a relationship that brings me joy, that brings me peace, that brings me happiness, or brings me much. But I'm contented because I made a commitment, so I stay there, but I'm miserable. So again, you, you have to have all those conversations. And again, one of the things I'm learning more than I care to admit is there's so many couples out there who are staying for the sake of the commitment, not because it brings fulfillment. And so you're staying in something that's miserable. And again, that's a personal call. That's a personal call as to how you deal with that. But if you start off communicating, being honest with each other, putting it on the table, having those tough conversations early on, then it will help to minimize. It won't el eliminate, but it'll help to minimize some of the challenges later in life. Sorry, I'm just uh, processing and soaking all that in. Um, and something, well, a lot of what you said, but one of the things that kind of stood out of, I've heard this, the phrase, if it's no longer serving you, like what are things that you need to put aside that are no longer serving you? And I feel, I get the sense that like you were saying, a lot of people are staying in relationships, um, entanglement, situationships, whatever you want to call it. They're staying for the sake of, but we've been together so long. And I know I've heard a lot of people say that of just, mm -hmm. but we, 
but we have kids or, you know, I didn't invest it four years, so let me try to make it work. And it is harder to walk away from someone or something after a long time, even a business or, a, you know, mm -hmm. being at a job or mm -hmm. involved in certain organizations. It's, but it's like, I even think about working in higher ed, like, well, we've always done it. Well, it's not working anymore. So mm -hmm. it's time to change. Um, so I think that's great, but have you, have any thoughts been jogged? <laughs> anything that you want to share? Anything else? No, I think, mm, I believe it's all, it's all been covered in one form or another, in one way or another. Mm. Here's, here's, here's a concept. Most people get married and we look at it from a, a romantic standpoint and if you li listen to the Disney Channel or to some of those true romance novels and they live happily ever after. It's a lie. Marriage isn't about happiness but holiness. Mm, okay. I need you to explain. Marriage is designed to honor God. But we think it's to satisfy and appease one another. And so we go into marriage with the wrong focus and the wrong motive. And so if you're looking for marriage to fulfill you and to satisfy you, again. Or even dating. That's right. So, so what's your purpose for getting married? What's your motive? That's the foundation. you got to look at that. Why am I, we, what, are we getting married? So I can get somebody to fulfill me? What, what's going on? And so again, it's a little bit deeper conversation than we have time to get into. But but look at the reason. Marriage was designed to honor God. Not happiness, holiness. The example given it says, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. A sacrificial love. It's a lot deeper than just the emotional attachment, the bond. It's a, it goes a lot more. It's, it's holistic. It's, it's all-encompassing. So the question again, what's your purpose for getting married? You were asking about dating, right? Some pointers on dating. I mean, that is a part of it. Yeah. Um, but no, I think in, I guess, and if you look at it and applying it to the context of, and in terms of the, I guess the advice would be for people dating or people in relate who are married, mm -hmm. because after I asked it, I thought, yeah, so you have for those who are young, younger married couples, but even for those who have been married for a long time, Absolutely. who haven't, who have been miserable or who have been sticking it out, or I've heard often there's people who, you know, they're together, they're married, they have their kids. And at that point, they're focused on the kids. And then after the kids leave the house, then it's, well, okay, well, who are you? What do we do? How do we go from there? So mm -hmm. I think I think everything that you all have shared is applicable in some way, shape, or form to everyone. And whether it be the romantic relationship, the family, or friendship, um, I would say some of the, the kind of just major takeaways, I, I would say, is first and foremost is getting to know yourself. Um, and spending that time with yourself and being honest about who you are and stop sending your representative out when you're dating and knowing your purpose and why for why are you dating? Why do you want to get married? What are you doing? And then the communication piece and being consistent in that communication and setting boundaries and then not just setting the boundaries, but maintaining and enforcing the boundaries within the relationship and then outside of it in terms of protecting what you have um, from outside outsiders, even if they are well-intentioned. Uh, but yeah, a lot to one, think that about. Go ahead. One point. I am not advocating separation or divorce. So please, <laughs> please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not advocating. I'm saying that we need to be honest where we are and address that. And if there's not fulfillment or contentment, then seek out help, counseling, so that you can talk to, to turn the curve. Don't stay there and don't continue to suffer in silence per se, but find the assistance, the help that you need. 
and try to get that. If you're going to stay committed to that relationship, then get the necessary help so that you can move forward and, and be fulfilled in more ways than one. But, but don't stay there suffering in silence. And, and I'm not saying, I'm not advocating divorce separation. And I want to make sure that's clear. Loud and clear, understood. So I do want to thank you all because I want to be respectful of your time. But <laughs> I want to thank you all for um, joining me today and just sharing, you know, opening up, sharing your lives and your experience with the public. Um, like I said, I've had the benefit of living with you all and learning from you but also i would say in recent years getting to know you all as like getting to know felix getting to know violet not just mom and dad and I, mm -hmm. that's been helpful for me um as i am making my way through this world and you know adulting in relationships but um if you all enjoyed what you heard i would say also be mindful or keep an eye out because they are currently participating, I guess kind of the featured uh, speakers in the series of Before I Do, I believe it's called, um, and just where they are sharing their life experiences and wisdom with, with us single people, I should say, <laughs> or just others who are interested in or just curious about marriage and some things to to yeah. think about, consider before getting to that point. So I will be sure to post that information um, in terms of where you can go to watch that and hear more from them. Um, so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, if you want, you can stick around for my random shower thought. <laughs> Would you guys no, like to hear it? We'll let you have fun at that. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you all again. Really hope you all enjoyed that because uh, it was eye-opening, enlightening for me as well. Uh, a lot of the information, I knew some parts, but some of the different little details were definitely new for me. Um, and as I mentioned before, I've been, it's been very beneficial seeing and getting to know them as individuals, as people, not just parents. And so it's uh, informed a lot of my decisions in terms of relationships or just life in general going forward. But Let's lighten the mood a little bit. This week's random shower moment or shower thought is uh, about the, if you ever heard of the show or seen the Dr. Pimple Popper, I don't watch it, I've seen it occasionally, but I have a lot of friends who really enjoy watching it, how and why. I just don't understand where you just sit and watch somebody pop pimples and like some of these things are huge really disgusting i don't know how it gets to that point or it's just it's crazy but it's almost like one of those things where like a train wreck it's horrible but i can't look away because the few times that I'm, I'm with them and i see it it's like yeah why but i'm still staring but i just wonder like how do these things form do people intentionally let them get that bad and then just so they can go on the show and have it done. And I understand some of these things are very serious conditions and that there are underlying issues, but it's just like, how and why and how, do, like, where does all of this come from? And then I think about everyone has, or most people have some version of blackheads or the whiteheads of things on the nose. And it's just like, no matter how much you scrape or you squeeze, you exfoliate, whatever, they just keep coming back. And this may be me showing my ignorance to how the body works or how things do, but it's just something that I've wondered, like no matter what I do or what people do, they seem to keep coming back. And then a whole show has been created or shows have been created based around these, these things. And I know that they're not just pimples or bumps, but it's weird. It's a lot, but hey, let me know your thoughts. Do you enjoy watching? pimples or different um I don't know if they're calluses what they're what they're called when they get that big and all of the pus comes out but do you enjoy it if you do please help me understand why but that's my thought for the week uh thank you all so much for listening like I said I do hope you were taking notes and that this was beneficial so many different things um I want to say the most important to me is taking the time to get to know yourself and doing the work and being honest with yourself as well as others um, with your family, friends, 
definitely, you know, if you're going to venture into a relationship with a significant other and even in terms of dating them or being in a committed relationship, subsequently marriage, that you are having those hard conversations with yourself as well as, well as with that person and do the checkup, to do the check-ins periodically to see how are we doing, how am I doing, is this serving me, is this helping, am I putting too much focus or emphasis on the other person for my happiness or am I taking ownership of that and responsibility and you know hey it's a, another part of adulting another part of the process and so keep that in mind keep pushing don't give up because in the end it's all working out for our good so thanks for listening until next time